Greetings, friends, fellow Earthlings, and explorers of life on Earth and maybe beyond. Welcome to Ask an Astrobiologist, the show that celebrates the science and celebrates the scientists involved in our quest to understand the nature of life. I'm your host with the most, Dr. Graham, the Space Beard Lau, and we're brought to you by the NASA Astrobiology Program and Saganet.org. Uh, as always, it's such a huge pleasure to be here, to join all of you, to be able to ask our world-renowned researchers in astrobiology the questions that we have about life out there. We're also very thankful for all of you out there in the Twitterverse and Instagram and TikTok and everywhere else sharing information about our guests, about our show. We want to highlight this month the Enfold account. That's the Network for Life Detection. Uh, the account is at Life Detection on Twitter. Uh, and a special thanks to Joey Pastersky uh, for helping to manage and lead that account uh, and for sharing information about our show with their audience as well. Now, this month's episode is going to be pretty awesome, especially near and dear to my heart, since I've done research in polar environments and trying to understand how life in a glacial system can help us learn more about life out there. This month, we're going to be chatting with Dr. Mark Skidmore, a professor in the Department of Earth Sciences at Montana State University. Uh, Dr. Skidmore conducts research on the biogeochemistry and geomicrobiology of glacial systems, examining the cycling of elements such as carbon, sulfur, nitrogen, and iron in these systems. His research also considers the habitability of icy terrestrial environments, especially subglacial systems, and how this can guide our search for habitable environments elsewhere in the solar system. Dr. Skidmore has fueled research experience in numerous glaciated systems in the Arctic uh, and Alpine regions and the Antarctic, uh, over 25 years of exploration and study. So welcome to Ask an Astrobiologist, Dr. Mark Skidmore. Hi, how's it going? It's going quite well. Thanks for joining us. Uh, it felt like a glacier environment in my, my, my office here a little bit ago until I got my heater working. Um, you do have to love those cold systems and being in them. Um, I think there's a lot to be said for those of us who've chosen to go out and explore those systems. Um, so yeah. I'm very glad to have you on the show to talk about your research in glacial environments. Yeah, pleased to be here. Well, so for every episode we have, we like to start off before we talk a bit more about your, your current research and, and the ways your research ties into astrobiology. We like to hear what got you into the science that you're doing. What is your science origin story that got you from young Mark Skidmore to Dr. Mark Skidmore, uh, the glaciologist and researcher? Yeah, so um, I think this goes back to if we think about, uh, you know, formative years, really sort of like middle and high school. Um, I was really fortunate, had, you know, good science background teachers in sort of like chemistry, biology, physics. But um, teachers um, that taught me geography, this is in the UK, um, they took us out on field trips um, out to not the no glaciers in the UK right now, but there are glaciated environments. So we went out and looked at these different glaciated environments, and that got me kind of interested in, in that aspect of sort of earth science or the earth system. And then when I got to uh, university as an undergraduate, the first week or so I was there, I talked to a student who was a third year, like so a senior at the university, and he was telling me about, oh, He'd been on this really cool glacier research project the past summer. So then I was like, oh, okay. So I went and talked to the professor involved and said, hey, uh, this sounds interesting. Would there be an opportunity to join this research project next summer? And he sort of said, okay, well, you know, this is I don't know, September, October time. We'll be figuring that out in the spring. And then, yeah, I went and joined that research project for the following three summers uh, on a glacier in the, in the Swiss Alps. And, um, yeah, so it was cool, and I really got into studying. They were more interested in hydrology and chemistry of the environments rather than microbiology at that stage. This is, you know, 25-plus years ago. But I studied the chemistry of the snowpack as sort of an honors thesis. Um, and then after doing my undergraduate, I then went uh, on to do graduate studies. The professor from Cambridge moved to Alberta um, in in Canada, and I went there to do my grad research. And again, we were looking at a glacier up in the Canadian High Arctic this time, up on Ellesmere Island in Nunavut, Canada. And that was looking again, trying to understand 
the glacial hydrology, the subglacial hydrology, the chemistry of these systems. And I was really trying to understand how carbon might be cycled in these in these environments. And of course, you have a good uh, committee member and a committee member who was actually an isotope geochemist said, oh, well, if you're going to study carbon cycling, you, you should really think about if there's a biological component. And at that time, that wasn't something that so many folk had really thought about. So then I went over to the Department of uh, Microbiology, talked to a prof there. She gave me all these cool, you know, this equipment and sampling, uh, you know, devices and enrichment media. So then I went and took it out to the glacier and collected samples, uh, and enriched them, some of them there, and then also collected samples to take back. Um, and then, yeah, the, the samples we enriched in the field, you know, <laughs> wouldn't say grew wildly, but there was a lot of biomass and growth in, in, you know, the big carboy that I'd added all this media to from the glacier waters. And so then we did some ex um, experiments on the, the basal ice. So that's the ice at the bottom of the glacier. So where the ice flows on the bottom of the glacier, scrapes long material that freezes onto the bed. It's got lots of really fine grained sediments. And so those fine grained sediments can provide potential, you know, carbon and or energy sources uh, for, for the microbes. Um, so yeah, they, um, you know, so then we ended up doing a whole bunch of research on uh, those, um, those sediments and we were able to demonstrate that there were a range of organisms. So there are organisms that are just sort of what I would call like normal or, uh, heterotrophs, organic uh, aerobic heterotrophs, um, but then we were also able to uh, grow um, at cold temperatures. So all of our experiments were done like in the fridge um, or at fridge temperatures. We were able to grow organisms that were capable of reducing nitrate or sulfate or uh, producing methane, so methanogens. And the interesting thing about those organisms is that they basically they're, they're anaerobes. They don't require oxygen. And these experiments that we did, you take the ice from the base and you melt it down and you put it under, you know, uh, an anaerobic headspace without oxygen. And these organisms, you know, grow and thrive. So that's kind of how I got into it. And it was a pretty cool uh, set of results. It's such a cool pathway, too. And I, I love, you know, one, there's the connection to great teachers and advisors and committee members along the way that have, you know, kind of been there for you to help you along, you know, in developing your career. But then also just, you know, just that thought of like the early geography of trying to think about these old glaciated systems to more modern systems. I, I grew up in the Great Lakes region of North America. And so as a young child, I was always kind of just enthused by this idea that glaciers could carve the environment, even though there aren't any glaciers present anymore. And so I always kind of found that a little shocking. Um, I've also been fortunate to go up to northern Canada to do research. Uh, I once asked some people there, what would you call a scientist uh, in the Nuktatuk? And, and they didn't actually know, but they did say that they would call me an umlik, which is, uh, is Inuk for a bearded person. Um, which I thought was pretty funny, um, but it is very cool to hear about you know this 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 you know sequence of research that you had through Ellesmere, and, and now you've been in so many different environments around the world. Uh, we did share through the NASA Astrobiology Twitter account a poll. Uh, we said you know our next guest, Dr. Mark Skidmore, studies environments that are cold, salty, and lack oxygen, uh, which is a great analog for Europa, uh, which is a, a nice astrobiology target. But we also wanted to know what other world kind of fits that description. We gave people the option of Saturn, Venus, Mercury, or Mars, and over 52% uh, percent of our respondents at nearly 400 votes uh, all said Mars, which is the correct answer. There are cold, salty, and lacking oxygen kinds of environments for just that kind of bi biology that you're discussing on Mars as well. And so one thing I wanted to ask you about was um, some of your early research was connected to this Martian Polar Science Conference that you attended, which was right around the time that that the NASA Astrobiology Program was really being being born and created at NASA. And so I'd love to hear the, the transition in your research from this Martian Polar Science Conference, then to more analog kind of based research in glacial systems as well. Yeah, no, I was really fortunate. I went to the uh, first conference on, on Martian Polar Science. Martian Polar Science. It was back in uh, 1998. And um, yeah, I was a graduate student and I really got exposed there to, you know, a whole plethora of 
um, talks and everybody, the vast majority of folks there were focused on, you know, uh, much more sort of physical sciences of the Martian poles and understanding the polar caps and how they operate. And, um, and yeah, it was just um, a very interesting uh, conference to go to um, and, and learn about that and also present my research and say, hey, these environments are not necessarily perfect analogs for Mars, but, you know, they're systems where we're looking at, you know, debris-rich ices, ices that have lots of debris, and there are certainly environments on Mars where one can think about uh, there being uh, environments where there's ice uh, that contains uh, a reasonable amount of debris. Um, so yeah, and then after after that, that just got me thinking more than just focusing on, you know, on, on Earth. One of the driving questions at that time was, A, originally, like, are there organisms there? Yes, there are. How are they, are they active? Yes, they are. Are they active at like sort of in situ temperatures? Yes, they are. Um, you know, but then it was like, okay, well, how could these systems then potentially guide us to to look for life elsewhere? Simply that you know you go out in in the in the solar system, and you know NASA's mantra was like follow the water, but then it's like okay, follow the water, but also the water on a lot of um, planets is in the form of ice. Or it's at least ice covering uh, a body of water. Oh, very cool. Yeah, um, I do. So before we talk a bit more about like, these icy systems, I, I do want to ask: What is your coolest experience that you've had? I and mean, you've been in the field so many times and have been to different places around the world. What is the coolest experience you've had on a glacier? Yeah, so I think that goes back to my graduate work when um, we were working on so the the glaciers, um, the 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 glacier in in Ellesmere. It's a, what's called a polythermal glacier. So that means there's sort of two types of ice. There's ice right at the margin of the glacier that's frozen to the bed because it's really cold. It's up at like 80 degrees north. So the, the, the ice at the margin is frozen to the bed. But the ice um, behind it further upstream is what we call tempered ice. So that'll have a, a water at the bed of the ice. And um, so water comes in from the surface or water builds up in the subglacial environment and it can't break through that um, that frozen ice barrier because it's frozen to the bed. And what happens is that at some point in time, there's enough water pressure builds back up that you end up with the water being sort of blasted out of the surface of the glacier and you can get a fountain, right, that comes up out of the glacier. I know you probably at least... Uh, uh, Hundred or more feet above the, you know, where the where the glacier bed is, and so the water blasts up out of that, and we're like, cool. Well, we can go sample that because that's water that's come in directly from the glacier bed. But when we were doing it, um, the water has forced its way up to the glacier bed through pressure and fracturing. And so when I was working there, um, working with a, a field assistant. And we're working, collecting samples, and then suddenly there's this zippering noise. And in front of us, we were standing next to this uh, water fountain. And so then the glacier in front of us, going back up the glacier, basically fractured in front of us, hydrofractured, and just sort of went. Chuk, 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 chuk. And so we were both like, oh, okay. Maybe we'll just move a little bit to the side um, and uh, and uh, and uh, keep keep out of the way of that. I mean, the fracture wasn't big enough for uh, an individual to like fall into. It wasn't like we would be falling into the chasm, um, but it was a very much a reminder that we were in a very active, uh, dynamic uh, system. And so, I think that's probably. Um, yeah, probably the coolest or certainly the most surprising, um, you know, thing that happened to me maybe in one of those things. Nice. Yeah, it sounds like it'd be a big shocker just watching the watching the ice unzip in front of you. Um, so, yes, with these glacial systems, I mean, obviously, so we mentioned that Mars can be an analog, you know, it can be an analog for Martian sites, but it's also an analog for Europa and Enceladus and these, these icy worlds. Um, specifically, we do have sites, you know, where there are lakes underneath of these glaciers that can serve as a way for us to explore what it's like to drill down through the ice and then to access materials in a lake or at the, at the base of the glacier down below, um, which is a, a good analog for Europa. 
um, if we ever do drill through the ice of Europa or just understanding some of the the, the, the dynamics of, of exchange of materials through the ice from that, that ocean or lake down below. Uh, and you've been involved in the SALSA project, the Subglacial Antarctic Lake Scientific Access Project. Uh, I'd love to hear more about that research, specifically about drilling down into lakes like that. Yeah, for sure. And so um, I'm involved. The SALSA project is uh, sort of the latest iteration of uh, Antarctic subglacial drilling. Um, I was actually involved in a previous project that was called WIZARD, and that was just another acronym. But we were just drilling into a different subglacial lake in West Antarctica. And so, yeah, the premise here is that we're drilling through, you know, a kilometer of ice to access a lake beneath that ice, uh, you know, that's like in, in the case of Salsa, we were drilling into subglacial Lake Mercer in West Antarctica, uh, and the lake, uh, when we sampled it, was about 14 meters deep. Um, and so uh, one of the cool things there, though, is that a lot of work went into, and people think about this from an astrobiological perspective, of clean access sampling, right? So we spend a lot of time uh, not just for the SALSA project, but the technology was really developed for the prior project called WIZARD, but was to build um, a system that cleans the water. So we access these lakes using a hot water drill. So that's basically like high temperature hot water, 80, 85 degrees C, and you blast it down and you make a hole to the, you know, through the ice with the hot water. But one of the key things is making sure that that water that you're putting down there is clean or is as clean as you can possibly get it um, so that you're not introducing like external uh, microbes into this pristine environment. And so we kind of get around that in two ways. One is obviously if you take the snow from the surface, that's the natural environment or that's the naturally occurring, you know, um, you know, material in that, in that environment. And then we put it through a series of filters um, and um, UV banks. And so there's basically a big filtration system inside, uh, a con um, you know, like a 40-foot container. And so we built the system, tested it um, here at Montana State, and then shipped it down to Antarctica. And that's what was used on both of these drilling projects. And so then the idea is that then the water that you – and we would test it out. There are all kinds of sampling ports uh, within the system. So you, you take samples and you check that the, the biomass or the number of cells that you have in that water that's going down is, you know, in, in our case, like orders of magnitude lower than the sample that you pull up out of the lake. So then you can be really confident and say, hey, well, the water that we put down to make the, the drill hole um, – was not the source of the microbes that we're getting out of the out of our samples in the lake. Very cool. It's almost like planetary protection, right? In this case, it's right. You know, it's it, glacial it, lake protection. <laughs> yeah, it's it, it's a it's a similar it's a similar kind of a, approach in terms of thinking about that way of doing it. And the similarly, the like all of the instruments that went down once we drilled the hole, they were all cleaned with hydrogen peroxide. And then if you go onto the the salsa website there's this cool photo too that once you put the the at the top of the drill hole there's a big huge uv lamp bank that we put down into the ice right at the top of the borehole so everything that went down through that uh, borehole at the top of it it's being zapped on the outside by um you know these strong uv lamps so we're really definitely concerned or trying as best as we can uh with sort of best practices to make the sampling, you know, as 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 biologically clean as we can get. Yeah, which is, is super crucial for planetary exploration as well. Of course, we have clean rooms where we try our best to sterilize, you know, rovers like Perseverance and Curiosity. And if we do ever design a Europa lander, we'll certainly try to 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 clean that and sterilize it as much as possible to avoid contaminating some other isolated system with potential biology. Um, I will come back to something though. You mentioned, so, so at Lake Mercer where you were doing this research, you mentioned the depth earlier. And, and we actually reached out on Twitter through NASA Astrobiology to ask our audience uh, how deep you had drilled to get down there. Uh, we had options of roughly 138 meters, 572 meters, 866 meters, or 1084 meters. Uh, and the audience took 8, 866. 
rather than the actual answer, which is just over a kilometer, it's 1,084 1, meters. Um, and so that's very deep to drill into these lakes here on Earth. Um, of course, drilling through Europa's ice would be even more. It's you know roughly 10 kilometers, I think, is the best estimate right now of ice. Um, but still, like 1,000 kilometers or 1,000 meters is, is still a lot of depth. How long does it take to drill down through that much? Yeah, it takes a few days in terms of um, to to drill all the way down. And again, there's a, a system that you set up where the you drill a hole first, and then you drill another parallel hole, which they call a keyhole or a rod well, a Rodriguez well. And so the idea is that you set up this sort of loop system so that you drill down, you connect those two at about 100 or 120 meters depth. So that then that means as you're drilling down, uh, into the ice in the in the borehole that you're drilling, there's then a return flow, and that return water is is a uh, a groundwater pump in that other well, and that returns the flow uh, back into the into the system for, for for cleaning the water. And so yeah, the drilling took a, a few days uh, to get down uh, into the into the lake. Um, and as one gets down to the lake, you also do, do this cool idea that they, you kind of like lower the pressure as possible, as, as as best as possible in your drilling. So you're still drilling down, but you're reducing the back pressure so that as soon as you hit the lake, then the water from the lake came back up the borehole at the bottom by, you know, sort of 20 or 30 meters. So again, the reason for doing that was again back to sort of your planetary protection argument that it's like, well, if water at the bottom comes back up the borehole, then it's way less likely that we're able to contaminate that. Even if we've done all of our cleaning really well, then having water come back up the borehole, uh, which is what happened, you know, that was the goal again of the the drilling strategy uh, to, you know, uh, uh, again, to, to make sure we, we, we could try and be as sort of as clean as possible. Yeah, very cool. Uh, I do want to talk now, now just for a little bit before we open it up to our audience questions about some of your your more recent research, including a new project that you're working on right now up in the Arctic. But before I get there, I, I think for our audience, a lot of people have never been in a glacial environment, have never been to the Arctic or or Antarctica. Um, like I mentioned, I, I was fortunate to spend some time in the Arctic over two weeks. You know, we brought along some special snacks. I, for one, argued for pemmican, which you know is, is a meat and fat with berries kind of mixture that that you know old polar explorers would take. Um, I wonder if you could just give us a, a brief explanation of your experiences, how long you've spent on these glacial <laughs> glacial systems, and and maybe some of the special treats that your teams have brought along just to make things a little more comfortable in those cold systems. Yeah, no, for sure. So, I mean, probably the longest field work was maybe as a graduate student up on Ellesmere, you know, like nine or 10 weeks in the field, and those would be in, um, you know, tent camps. Um, you know, uh, that's probably the you know, the sort of most maybe primitive and longest time in the field. And um, yeah, the real treat for me was always like, you know, in the cold environment, you know, chocolate bars, nothing like, I mean, I, I grew up in uh, Birmingham, which is pretty close to the, you know, a, a Cadbury factory um, in the UK. And so like, you know, couple of chocolate bars a day it's fantastic it's just like you know that's back to the treat of the environment and and frankly when you're in such cold temperatures cold environments and you're camping you know you, you burn off the, the energy from those chocolate bars pretty rapidly so certainly the thing that i always look forward to is that you know you get you get to at least eat one chocolate bar a day if, and if not two chocolate bars a day so it's always pretty good yeah, I will say one of our collaborators was, was thoughtful enough to bring bring along a lot of extra chocolate <laughs> just for us. Um, so I, I'd love to hear now about some of your more recent work. You have a, a new P-STAR funded by NASA to do some research in the Arctic on Devon Island with a new lake system. And, and a paper just came out about this system that we shared through the SegaNet uh, social media accounts. I, I wonder if you could share with our audience um, what's so cool about this lake and, and why this system is so appealing for research. Right. So the the difference is that with this lake, so this is a uh, this is a, a lake that we uh, think exists beneath the Devon ice cap, again up in the Canadian High Arctic. And what makes it intriguing or interesting as a as a research target is that 
the lakes that have done work on doing exploration in uh, Antarctica or the one that's behind me, I- which is in Iceland, uh, they're, they're freshwater lakes, right? So they're uh, really dilute. The water looks like you might find in, in you know, glacial runoff mountain streams. They're not very, uh, not very salty. Um, whereas the intriguing thing about the, the, the Devon situation or the Devon ice cap uh, case is that the lakes have been discovered through, you know, through radar techniques. So you bounce radar off the bottom. And if there's a water body, you get a different reflection than if you have a rock bed. Um, but the interesting thing there is that the, the temperature that one would predict at the bed and that people have drilled like further away from the lakes, but people previously had, you know, drilled ice cores to the bed of the, the glacier where it's frozen to the bed, uh, that the the ice temperatures could be sort of in the range of like, you know, minus 10, minus 14, um, minus 15 C. And so then that's like, wow, well, if there's a body of water or fluid uh, at that temperature, it's got to be really salty for it to maintain, you know, being a, a fluid body. So again, that was like that makes it really different from these other subglacial lakes that have been uh, that have been discovered. And so now our project is drilling into the actual lake. We actually don't really have the technology yet to do that cleanly. That's still, you know, hopefully that might be the the source of you know future work. But right now we were thinking about okay, well, those lakes uh, potentially drain. Uh, beneath glaciers that are, are feeding to the north and the south of the ice cap. And so then the idea would be to go in and try and sample where the water comes out beneath those glaciers to see if we can see if there's, um, you know, saline waters. Uh, and also do some more characterization again with the radar system or with the helicopter based radar system to look uh, at the you know, at the main body of these outlet glaciers to try and figure out if we can see where there might be channels um, beneath the beneath the ice. Oh, that's such cool research. Uh, I think we probably have some questions coming in about that work uh, and other research you've done. Uh, I actually see we have a lot of audience questions coming in, but before I get there, I have two really quick questions for you. Um, okay. One is, is what is the most alien environment? What is the most you know non-terrestrial, just like out of this world place that you've been in these Arctic or Antarctic systems? So I think that might be like back to um, in, in Antarctica, I was part of a research team uh, where um, we chainsawed a tunnel or the team chainsawed a tunnel into a glacier um, in, in Antarctica. And so being actually inside a glacier um, in a tunnel that's a pretty, to me, that's a fairly alien environment. That was pretty, pretty interesting and pretty exciting. Well, that's awesome. Um, so, so I do have so one more fun question. So you, you shared some pictures with us before the show. They've been coming up uh, while we've been discussing your research and your work. One of those pictures, though, our producer and director, Mike Toyon, wanted to know a bit more about because he loved it so much. Um, it's a picture of two people, yourself included, on a glacier playing yeah. guitar and clarinet, um, may- maybe busking to the Arctic. Um, yeah. I wonder if you could give us a little explanation about what was happening in that image about uh, playing some instruments on a glacier. Right. So uh, the, the the other person in that uh, in that photo is a colleague and friend of mine, Anthony Arendt. He's actually out at University of Washington as a researcher. Um, and uh, when we went to the Arctic, I play clarinet. I play in a bunch of different bands, and Anthony, uh, you know, played guitar. And so, you know, going back uh, twenty odd years ago. There wasn't any internet, there wasn't any sat phones, there wasn't anything else. So, you know, in the evening, you know, you could play a bit of music, right? You know, sit, we're in a, in a tent. And so then it's like, okay, well, you can get out your guitar. We got out my clarinet um, and, you know, we could jam along and play some tunes, right? Because it's like, well, you know, there wasn't a lot of, well, there wasn't a lot else uh, in terms of, um, you know, entertainment. Occasionally, we would pick up uh, off the HF antenna. You can pick up the sort of like BBC World Service news, you know. Um, but other than that, um, we were pretty much like you know, short radio uh, schedule call with the base each day just to tell them that we were, you know, yep, we're still alive. Everybody's good. But other than that, it was like, oh well, entertainment then was things like yeah, playing some music. 
No, oh, fantastic. Yeah, I, I wish now in hindsight I'd taken along like a didgeridoo or harmonica or something to the to the Arctic with me. Maybe, maybe next time. Yeah, um, for sure. <laughs> I will open it up now. So we do have a bunch of audience questions coming in, especially from the YouTube channel. So uh, thanks to those who are asking. We're going to start a- asking those questions now. We'll try our best to get to as many as we can. Um, the first question comes from user rendering, rea- rendering reality 3D animations. Uh, they ask, can you compare processes that cycle key minerals or elements in glacial systems here on Earth to possible interfaces between ice and subsurface oceans for Europa and Enceladus? In terms of, sorry, say that question again. Just... Yeah, so it sounds like they're asking if we can compare compare the processes that cycle uh, nutrients, that cycle elements in our glacial systems here to the potential for cycling uh, through the ice on Europa or Enceladus. Yeah, I mean, it, that that becomes a little bit more challenging to make that direct analogy. I think on Earth, we understand, the, or we're starting to understand those processes um, a lot better uh, on Europa. It would really depend on like, hey, w- w- what do we actually find that's down there in the ocean? So to sort of say that, I mean, I... I can't tell you, or I don't think anybody can really tell you what what that uh, mineral assemblage will be. So um, I can't really provide a definitive answer to that. So I think it's sort of like that will be something that we would have to figure out. Like, well, what's the what what are the mineral assemblages that are down there, um, and and then what those interactions might be. I mean, I know we don't expect them to necessarily be hugely different from uh, what we might find uh, in in terrestrial systems. But, you know, um, yeah, I guess I just, <laughs> you could speculate about all kinds of things, but um, I, I think it'd be, you know, probably wiser to figure it out when we actually see what's there. Yeah, it could always change our minds a lot once we actually get there and start taking data and, and samples. Right, um, yeah, yeah. Or having a better idea again of like what you were describing is like, well, you know, how deep is, or how thick is the ice shell before you get down to the to the ocean below and i think that's still a reasonably open question in terms of the the ice depth yeah absolutely yeah there's been a lot of proposals over the years for everything from one kilometer to 40 kilometers of depth on on the icy shell and so there's a lot of questions there europa clipper will help us answer some of that for europa at least we'll learn a lot more about the surface of europa and get much higher resolution imaging and some spectra Um, but there's still a lot ahead for europa so Um, I do have another question here that came in from Dan in the cave on YouTube. Um, We get lots of questions about, you know, how do I build a career in astrobiology? Um, But I I really like uh, Dan in the cave's question here. Uh, They're hoping to start a PhD this fall in astrobiology and with a focus in glacial microbial communities. Um, And so they want to know if you were to start a PhD now, what would you (laughs) want to focus on? Right. Yeah. Well, if I was doing that now, um, I think I would, yeah, you know, key in on uh, some of these environments in terms of, again, it it sort of depends on that research question. But I would be thinking for sure about focusing like on uh, maybe anaerobic organisms, um, because I think that like, you know, a lot of these environments, whilst there may be some you know, oxygen in these environments, there's likely to be quite a lot of sort of anaerobic niches, um, you know, in a lot of these systems. Um, so I think there's probably a, a, a fairly good, you know, uh, range of uh, anaerobic uh, metabolisms that one could look into um, and think about how those could potentially be ones that you might find, uh, whether it will be on, on Mars or, or say on Europa. Indeed. Um, these next two questions, I'm going to bring them together, actually. So we have one from user T Vinit Ready on YouTube and another from CJF on Twitter. Uh, so T Vinit first uh, wants to know how psychrophiles adapt to extreme cold environments. Um, and, you know, that's things like creating the, these antifreeze proteins inside of cellular structures to avoid freezing and, and stuff like that. Um, but then C, C, CJF wants to know if purple phototrophic bacteria exist in glaciers. Um, specifically, they want to know a bit more about the production of hydrogen from some organisms through phototrophy uh, in glaciers. And so I wonder if you could speak to the, these two kinds of things, these organisms that are kind of adapted to cold systems and how they do so, and maybe some of the unique metabolisms we see there. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, so um, the the first question, uh, the first question is about uh, uh purple phototrophic organisms on glaciers and i have to say sorry i'm not like super familiar with uh with those um and so 
you know, that's not really where I've been spending a lot of time. The subglacial environment is one lacking in light. And so I've not really focused so much on phototrophs. And, and so I'm less familiar with the, the idea that they might produce hydrogen. Um, that's not, that's just not something I've, I've, I've researched. Um, um, and sorry, and then what was the second question? Uh, so that other one was really, how do psychrophiles adapt to extreme cold conditions? Right. So again, just as you'd mentioned, there are there are different adaptive strategies. Often it's like flexibility in membranes that are able to adapt to cold environments. And then also um, people, the organisms will make what are called sort of compatible solutes inside so that as you get colder, often you find that some of the organisms that are cold tolerant may also be somewhat salt tolerant, right? Because it's like once you get below zero, your solution that you might be surviving in might be quite briny, right? So it, it, if I have a, a saline solution at minus 5C, um, organisms will still be able to thrive and survive in those, but they may also then need to be adapted again to, uh, you know, uh, to cope with the, the, the higher salt concentrations. Mm, yeah, it's, it's, and there's so many organisms around our planet who've adapted to these extreme systems. Uh, and the organisms, life as we know it, really is driven by redox processes, by reductants and oxidants in the environment. And you've, you've studied these subglacial systems, looking at the potential sources of energy for these uh, microbial energetics. Our next question from Fanny Creativa uh, on YouTube, uh, they want to know if we have, have a, any knowledge of the reductants and oxidants for biology on Mars in anaerobic conditions? Will they be similar to what you were, you were looking at in these subglacial systems? Yeah, I mean, I think broadly speaking, you're going to have the same, um, you know, you have the same sort of uh, what I would call it, like the same ingredients um, that you do on Earth, right? In terms of, you know, you'd have hydrogen or CO2, um, or you might have different energy couples. So you'd have things like there was potential for sulfate, or especially if I think about Mars, like iron, I mean, that, that's one thing that you think very strongly about is the capabilities of, you know, uh, iron utilization. Um, so I think that, you know, realistically, you'd, you'd think that there would be a similar suite of, um, of, uh, of elements and or compounds uh, uh, that you would find on Mars that you might find on, on Earth. I mean, they may be in different concentrations and they may be found in different environments, but I, you know, I, you know, if you drew out your matrix, I think you'd still say that a lot of them are possible. But again, like back to Mars, I'd be like, I'd think about iron, right? You know, uh, as an important element or as a important in metabolism. Because when I look around, it's like, hey, what do I see everywhere? Yeah, absolutely. I iron and sulfur are both enriched in the Martian surface. And so those are very good sources for us to look at. Um, we have another kind of Martian question here about the recent paper from Chris House and colleagues looking at a depletion in carbon-13 isotopes in the regolith of via curiosity. Um, so Aaron Abapadar wants to know uh, if that could be biological. I think I'll answer that one myself really quickly um, because, one, Aaron Ava, it's really worth reading the paper. Um, the researchers did a great job of, one, discounting contamination from organics on the instrument from Earth. But they also suggest three interpretations – one of them that that we, we go through a, a GMC, a giant molecular cloud, every 100 million years or so, and it could be carbon isotopes coming from that. Um, another is that it could be volcanic eruptions putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere that then is going through photolysis, breakdown via light, and forming the, these, these different isotope fractionations. But one of the other possible explanations could be fractionation of isotopes due to life. Uh, and so I highly recommend reading the paper. It is a, it's a, it's a, a short read, but it's a very good paper um, where they explore the possibility for methanotrophy as well as methanogenesis being involved in this very big depletion in heavier isotopes of carbon. Um, but I actually wanted to ask another question I saw come in that I think is, is pretty fun. Uh, this is from David, David Cooter on YouTube. Uh, so David says, uh, Dr. Skidmore, how have advancements in metagenomic analysis affected <laughs> your research and recent years, uh, how big of an impact do you think this new generation of sequencing has on astrobiology? Yeah, well, definitely. So um, I'll tell you straight off the bat that, like, you know, I don't have a huge, um, you know, large amount of expertise in metagenomics personally, but I work with colleagues uh, that do. And what the 
the ability of metagenomics has uh, has done is definitely been able to take you know effectively like the entire sequence for a, a community um, and start to put that together and start to think about the potential metabolic pathways that might exist in those uh, in those systems. Um, and so uh, again, uh, you know, that can be really really helpful uh, as a guide, um, you know, towards the types of metabolisms. Um, but it, there's still, in my humble opinion, a, a really good uh, role for then saying, great, that might be the potential metabolisms. Now we use that to then design some experiments, maybe to investigate the most like likely metabolisms that are that are suggested through the metagenomic analysis, right? Because it's like, it's one piece of the puzzle. Um, but then if you really want to see if that's actually what's going on, then you'd want to think about designing experiments that that could, you know, that take that as a guide, but then, um, you know, that, but then take that kind of take that forward. Absolutely. Yeah. And I was fortunate with my research. I wasn't doing metagenomics. Uh, my colleague, Chris Trevetti, was doing that. And, and before me, Catherine Wright was doing some metagenomics. I was doing the geochemistry and mineralogy because these things, they pair together. You have to understand the, the system itself. What are the inputs to the system? What is the chemistry of the system? Uh, and that kind of feeds directly into our next question from Cyan E. Ford on Twitter. Cyan says uh, they're a PhD candidate. Um, and they're working on long, isolated, subterranean, hypersaline fluids. Go figure. Oh, cool. um, so Cyan wants to know, uh, how how long have systems like the Devon subglacial lake been isolated? Um, or if, if we have knowledge of how long this may have been isolated, and maybe you can speak certainly to other lakes that we have data on too, that we know how long they've been isolated. Um, and what can this tell us about the possibility for extant life on Mars or icy moons? Right. No, for sure. Yeah. The the, the 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 question of isolation is is always kind of challenging because it's sort of like part of it's how do you define that right because um, you know there's potential there is some input but it might be very slow in these subglacial environments like like ice melts at the base and there is some amount of throughput but most people have made estimates certainly like in the Devon case we'd be talking about like thousands of years um, and then places like subglacial like Vostok in Antarctica people have argued for hundreds of thousands of years that that system uh, might have been isolated. Um, and so, again, back to what does that tell us about for other environments? I mean, I would think that somewhere like, you know, if we can ever get to sample subglacial Lake Vostok, um, you know, that really would be quite interesting because uh, that system is thought to have existed uh, as far as I know, for at least millions of years, not to say isolated, but the system's in a big rift basin. So um, it's been been around for a long time. So that would be a really interesting, you know, target to answer or to address that question relative to you know the longevity uh, of those systems and their and their isolation. Absolutely, and that, that kind of goes into the input into the system, and how long has it been, you know, an isolated system or not? Um, so we, we do have another question here from Space TV on YouTube, um, asking about uh, if we go drilling on Europa, uh, would you, would we or should we drill into the fracture lines? So on, on Europa, we have these linea, these you know these large cracks on the surface where we've identified identified sulfur species in the cracks. They might be the place where there is communication with the subsurface ocean. And so Space TV wants to know if you think we should drill into those fractures or if we should avoid them. Yeah, I'm not necessarily thinking that we would drill into the fractures per se, um, mainly because it, uh, until we know whether there are other targets, that's part of the idea of the radar analysis, um, is that maybe there are other uh, water bodies or brine bodies within the shell um, that might be identified uh, that may be better targets than, than the fractures. Uh, so I'd, I'd kind of want to know more about like what else there exists there before saying for sure, oh, we should definitely uh, target those uh, those environments. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, there's, there's so much more to explore, right? Um, and one thing we could explore, so there's been some recent research suggesting uh, potential subsurface lakes on Mars. 
um, perhaps underneath of some ice at the poles, but also uh, in other regions, potential signs of subsurface lakes. So uh, user Aaron Gibbons on YouTube wants to know um, if you have any thoughts about whether subglacial lakes or subsurface lakes on Mars might be the best places to look as habitable niches uh, for life on Mars. Yeah, possibly. I think that the lakes that have been suggested, certainly beneath the ice, um, I think that could be really challenging because, A, I think there might be a little bit of, I wouldn't say controversy, but certainly differing theories about whether they are really lakes uh, beneath the, the ice. But I still think, even if there are, I think the, the projected temperature is sort of like minus 50, minus 60 C. Um, and so that might not be a particularly great place um, you know, uh, for, for microbial life based on what we know on Earth in terms of, to the best of my knowledge, there hasn't been evidence of activity, microbial activity at, at temperatures that, that cold. Um, but I think you might want to look in the subsurface that is that at some depth in the subsurface, you'll find, um, you know, brine and or water temperatures that will be much closer to zero, right? If you go down into the subsurface, you'll find environments where uh, it wouldn't be quite so cold. So I think I might want to investigate those types of systems just because I think then, you know, that you're more likely to find, uh, find, 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 or you're more likely to be looking in conditions where you might find viable organisms rather than if it's minus 70. Um, I, yeah, I don't know of any evidence that that would be a, a temperature where life could thrive. Yeah, that's extremely cold uh, for any kind of you know catalytic process as well. Um, so we're going to go back now to, to Devin because um, so, Devin came back. Devin Cooter came back on YouTube and asks, uh, are saline subglacial pools uncommon? Um, they say, uh, I would think salt exclusion due to freezing would increase the abundance of saline environments. And so I guess they want to know, like, what, why is it you know so intriguing to find a more hypersaline lake? Right. So uh, beneath the ice, that's the, 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 the distinction. So you can find uh, saline pools definitely like in sufficient environments, you get evaporation, you get saline, you get brine channels in sea ice. So when you make sea ice every year, like as you freeze that sea ice, you exclude salt uh, into, the, into the channels um, and you end up with pretty briny channels right within the sea ice. So yeah, these things exist. It's just that beneath um, an ice mass, again, I just haven't, uh, you know, I've never heard of a of of a of a an example on Earth anyway where there's actually like hypersaline fluid, right? That um, that's the bit that's unusual because all the other systems, certainly the ones that we've investigated. Um, you know, or we've actually drilled into, they're all fresh. And in a lot of other environments, I think people would, um, you know, predict that they should be fresh based on looking at like the ice depth and, you know, the geothermal heat flux and the predicted temperature. And so the fact that we have a lake, um, and the other thing that's interesting, right, from a sort of glaciological perspective is the lakes are right in the center of the ice cap, which is... Uh, you know, a little bit more unusual um, than you might find in um, other systems, especially those um, where, you know, the lakes are temperate. They're, they're often found maybe um, underneath uh, outlook glaciers or going towards the margins, um, but maybe not quite beneath, uh, right beneath the ice divide. Mm, indeed. And so, yes, yeah, so just, yeah, so there are certainly some saline systems, but maybe not hyper saline lakes is the, is the big difference there. Right, yeah, and especially again, to the best of my knowledge, beneath like a uh, a large ice mass. Um, yeah, that's very cool. Um, so our our next question, I'm, I'm going to expand a little bit. Uh, user at uh, Anish on Twitter. Uh, one, they say that it's a treat to hear about your research. Um, so thank you for thank that. Thank you. No, thank um, you. Then they say, I would like to know if you were able to identify any novel microorganisms within these extreme cold environments. And I personally would, ex would expand that a little bit, but maybe like what is the most intriguing thing that you've found so far in your research? Yeah, I mean, in terms of the, the organisms, you know, yes, we have found sort of 
quote, novel organisms, i.e. You've, you've got an isolate that nobody else has got ever or has, has exactly that particular isolate. But, you know, there are they're related or closely related to lots of other organisms. So uh, at one level, they're not necessarily, I wouldn't say, that special. Um, but I think what's interesting is certainly uh, organism – uh, a thiobacillus species that was that was isolated out of uh, the glacier in the Canadian Rockies. What's neat is that you know the metabolism is pretty good at five degrees C, and it doesn't get that much more efficient if you increase the temperature. So this is something that looks like it might have a little bit more. Wh whether you want to say it's actually adapted to that temperature, maybe you can't say that, but certainly at sort of cold, like fridge-like temperatures, um, you know, the organism thrives pretty well. And so I'm always interested in, I think those are the sort of organisms that are interesting. And again, it's organisms that back to what you were describing is when you grow them in the lab, you also want to see that back to if you use um, you know, genomic techniques, that if I've taken an example out of the community that if I uh, you know, extract the community DNA and I do sequencing of that, if it's maybe 16S genes, at least you're like, oh, wow, in that community, we find a lot of phylotypes in the community or phyl so sequences that are uh, closely related to thiobacillus, i.e. the organism that you uh, are, have been able to grow in the lab so that then you can tie that back in and say, hey, the organism that we grew in the lab really closely related to you know organisms within the the natural environment yeah absolutely yeah it's important to have both those pieces of information too because there might be a bunch that we're still missing and so it's, it can't all just be what we're growing and cultivating it has to be the things that we're actually exploring what's what's possible based on the thermodynamics of the system the chemistry of the system and then we can start looking for some of the things that might be there and when it comes to looking for things that might be there our next question is a kind of fun one um, from Anurup Mahanti, who is not only a production assistant for Ask an Astrobiologist, he's also a visiting scholar at Blue Marble Space Institute of Science uh, in my group. Uh, and he was very fortunate this past year in the summer, he had a chance to visit Ladakh uh, in northern India uh, near the Himalaya or in the Himalaya. Um, it's a very high altitude site, uh, 4,500 meters, um, where they serve as a Mars analog. And there's also glaciers in this site. And so Anurup wants to know um, what the differences are from what we call, you know, alpine glacial systems, these high altitude glacial systems to low altitude glacial systems. Um, are there differences in the biology of these systems that maybe can teach us about habitability? Yeah, um, to the best of my knowledge, I've not really uh, seen anything about the the microbial populations, again, in the subglacial environment that really differ from, you know, I've looked at systems, uh, alpine systems that, yeah, might be at slightly hello, higher elevations, uh, not as high as, uh, as, in, as in the Himalaya. But I haven't seen any reports about that. I think the difference might be potentially the organisms that you might find um, in the surface or in the snowpack, that's potentially where you might see some differences, right, based on both altitude and potentially as well, like distance from, you know, the, the ocean or a marine source that might give you different populations of your sort of superficial, uh, um, you know, microbial communities. But in the subsurface, I mean, the organisms that are working on ground up rocks um, to get their chemical energy, whether that's in the Himalaya or whether that's in, you know, Alaska or the Canadian Rockies or, you know, um, the high Arctic, you know, those are probably going to be pretty similar, right? Because there's not a big difference between, you know, the, the minerals that you find in those from grinding up the rock. It's the same kind of suite of, uh, of maybe minerals that you find in, in, in those different systems. Yeah, absolutely. And so like that, that might actually answer our next question as well to a degree here. So Dan in the cave has asked another question. Okay. Um, if you think the physical characteristics um, from like snow versus fern versus uh, glacier um, has a drastic effect on the microenvironments experienced by communities there. And so I, I think they are asking kind of like about these surface kind of uh, areas again. Yeah. So uh, again, uh I, I think that the, it, for sure uh, the the person asking the question is right that it's going to make a pretty big difference in terms of thinking about um, you know the uh, 
the uh, the type of material that's on the surface, the inputs to that surface. Um, you know, question is like how much dust is blown onto that surface? How close is it to uh, you know uh, local marine sources or other other potential sources that that potentially could you know could seed that environment? Right? You can imagine that there's places on Earth where there's not a lot of like you know middle Antarctica. It's not a lot of places that would be seeding like that surface snow, apart from purely like atmospheric input. Whereas if you went to the coast, you'd be looking at uh, quite a different range of both microorganisms and or inputs of like dust and aerosols and other things. Um, so yeah, you I think you end up with a, a, a really broad range of potential uh, environments uh, on the surface of these glaciers for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think for Dan in the cave, uh, one thing you might want to look into, there's these really interesting things that form on glacial surfaces called cryoconite. Um, it's material of, of dust, uh, as Dr. Skidmore mentions, it's blowing in. Um, they accumulate in little areas that kind of start to the, they, they change the albedo of the ice. And so how the insulation from the sun comes in, they melt their own little cones into the surfaces of the glacier. And, and some researchers have studied that cryoconite material to see where the dust inputs are coming from so far away to land on these glacial surfaces, all this dust coming in. So um, it's worth looking into if you're intrigued more about the surface processes, for sure. Um, so Dr. Skidmore, I have one more question that I want to ask from the audience. Uh, for those I, I can't get to, I, I apologize. We had so many awesome questions, but we have one, time for one more, I think, here. Um, so from Ruchira Pau on YouTube, uh, Ruchira says, first off, it's absolutely fascinating to learn about glacial habitability from you. Um, and then Rashir says they, they'd be glad to know more about the challenges mm -hmm. associated with this kind of field research, um, especially pertaining to your work in trying to isolate microbes or take samples for microbes. But I think I, I'd love, you know, in these le next two minutes that we have left from you, um, just, you know, what are the, the challenges in general about the research that you've done? Yeah, I mean, the, the, one of the, the primary challenges is always logistics, is getting to the glaciers, because glaciers usually aren't necessarily in, in relatively accessible environments. Um, and then, you know, the, often the question is, well, access in terms of not access from a permitting standpoint, but physical access, right? So you want to sample waters coming out of the base of the glacier. Well, sometimes that's relatively straightforward. Um, but then when you want to get the sediments, um, that I don't know if they were part of the, the the images that were shared, but you know one of the challenges is sometimes if if you can find like a cave um, uh, or an opening at the base of the glacier that you can you know, basically that you can get into, uh, and then you can take samples right at the the ice bed interface. That's obviously the best place to sample. And back to the challenges of that. So then a good time to go is like October, uh, if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, because the seasonal belt, um, like the meltwater that feeds into the glacier, that's pretty much turned off by October, no more surface melting. And before the ice closes down to what we call plastic closure, um, you can then potentially have the opportunity to go into some of these caves um, beneath the ice to actually uh, to take some samples. Um, so, yeah, I'd say access. And then obviously the other thing, too, is that once you've got your samples, you have to be pretty uh, careful and also efficient of saying, right, I want to be able to keep these nice and cold. Um, and so sometimes uh, back to that Canadian Rockies example, you know, got pretty good at carrying up a five liter dura of liquid nitrogen, um, you know, uh, so that. You take your sample, you put it in your little tube, and you flash freeze it on site and keep it frozen so that then uh, you can be pretty confident that when you take it back to the lab, that then nothing's really changed since you took your sample. Yeah. I will say one time we were bringing an ice block back from the Arctic, and we got stuck in Ottawa for two days. And so we had the hotel manager of the hotel we were staying at allow us to put our samples in their freezer <laughs> um, while we're waiting for transport back just to keep those samples nice and cold. Um, so Dr. Skidmore, it has been a huge pleasure having you on Ask an Astrobiologist. Thank you so much for joining us and just sharing so much about your work. Well, thank you very much. I enjoyed the opportunity. And thanks to all the folks out there for some really interesting and intriguing questions. 
And for all of those watching, if you want to continue communicating with us, one thing I'd love to know from you is, is what is the most alien place you've been to? Have you been to a glacier? Have you been to a weird system on the Earth? Uh, why not jump over to the at NASA Astrobio Twitter account or at Saganorg or me at Cosmobiologist and just let us know uh, what are some cool places you've been. Uh, if you'd like to sign up for the NASA Astrobiology newsletter to receive further information about our show or other events and opportunities through NASA Astrobiology, uh, we are sharing the link for that with you right now. Uh, so for everyone out there, thank you so much for joining us. To Dr. Mark Skidmore, thank you so much for being on the show and sharing your expertise with us. And for everyone, please remember to stay curious. <laughs> <laughs>